Hello folk, how you doing? Scotty. So I was asked to do a response on Victor Macarino on the issue to do with the labour theory of value. Now I've gone through this numerous times before. So let's just cut straight to the point. In his argument of what he's explaining, he's basically going on about how, oh well, value isn't just down to this of use. Let's have a listen to some of his argument here. Back once again, this is Victor Magariño. And today we're looking at a video by this online platform slash uh, YouTube channel called Learn Liberty where they teach you how to misinterpret the classical economists and they defend to the very death your freedom and your liberty to use strawman arguments against some of the strongest and most common sense arguments put forth by some of the most brilliant minds in the history of economics. The particular issue that we're going to be looking at today was brought up by this uh, Learn Liberty YouTube channel in 2011 with professor from George Mason University, Don Boudreau, where they speak about subjective value theory and they pretend as if what they are saying in that video somehow disproves the theory of value held by the classical economists before the marginalist revolution in 1871. So let him speak for himself. One of the most crucial insights of economics is that value is subjective. It means value ultimately comes from the human mind. It really? Now, of course, that might be the case if by value you define, well, value to be uh, your particular preference of a determined good or service. But if you define value as something else, you might find that you are actually wrong. First important thing here before we go on to his argument between exchange and use value. This is his concession where he has basically rejected that it's consumer's preference that determines what value is, therefore determines what the price is. You can see immediately how illogical his argument is because he's about to just illustrate this by trying to say that two products, despite one not selling at a specific given time to the other, is somehow going to hold the same value relative to that of the average necessary labour time. Just just listen to this. So it depends on, on how you define value, but this is one of the most profound insights of economics, really, that everyone has their own valuation of things. I mean, isn't that completely obvious? Now, of course, that is completely obvious for anyone that lives in the real world, but, I mean... Why would he need to say this? He needs to say it because the reality in the real world is its subjective theory of value, it's people's opinion of specific given products that determines whether a product is going to exchange or not. So even with your argument on exchange value, it's still going to be determined down to the consumer's preference. It's subjective theory of value. I'm not going to agree upon an exchange unless... I have value on the other product. But where's that product's value going to come from? It's going to come from my preference, my individual preference. It's a bit like if I pick a product up in a shop and I hand it over the counter, I hand the money over. It's my subjective theory of value. I like that particular product and I'm willing to pay for it at that specific given price. It's subjective theory. So value does not come from just because you're exchanging. The value is going to be determined down to consumer preference up here. What people think the value of that product is. You know, to, to someone else, that product that I'm buying could be a piece of crap to them. That's where value really is going to come from. Not because you're simply exchanging something. An exchange is only going to take place if someone has value in something to begin with. It's essentially down to what consumers are willing to part with in order to get that product. And the, the issue that you completely ignore, and again this has been pointed out even in the politically incorrect guide to socialism. Its real intellectual death blow was dealt in 1920 by Ludwig von Mises, based on the relatively dry and technical question of the use and nature of prices in an economy. As we know from our discussion of the labor theory of value, socialists of the Marxian bent hold prices to be at some level objective. In part, this is an outgrowth of socialism's pretense that it is a scientific system for understanding and organizing a society. If economic values are in constant flux, 
as is known by anybody who has followed the stock market or observed pricing trends at your local grocery store, then central planning is impossible. To counteract that criticism, socialism posits that economic values are fixed and knowable. For the socialist, a product has a certain value, and it is a moral imperative that the worker be compensated at a level equal to the value of the thing produced. Under the socialist understanding, prices are endogenous, an aspect of the thing itself, reflecting the material, resources, time, expertise, and, above all, the labor involved in its creation. But for Mises, and for practically all modern economists, prices are exogenous, reflecting only how people value a particular product. This may seem like an oversimplification, a product is only worth what you can sell it for, but, in practice, the radical subjectivism of Mises provides an infinitely richer and more nuanced model of pricing, and thus of human action, than does the static Marxist model. That's because the Mises model asks not only what is it worth, but what is it worth to whom, at what time, in what context, in relation to what other goods. Let's just move on with this argument because this is where he is going to make a fool out of himself. And the reason for this is that he's later on going to try to say that this somehow disproves, this obvious fact somehow disproves the labor theory of value, even though it actually does not. Now, these T-shirts uh, both cost me about the same amount of time to make the same amount of money. So in terms of what I spent, the resources that went into these T-shirts, it's the same. But you know what? The value of the Che t-shirt is in fact a lot higher to most people than is the value of the Milton Friedman t-shirt. If for some reason Che falls out of favor in the public mind, the value of the Che t-shirt falls. If the value of Milton Friedman's image rises, if people come to really like Milton Friedman, the value of the Friedman t-shirt increases. So this is again also relative to how you define value. If you define value as simply use value, how much people want something, then it is in fact the case that if people like something more, then that thing becomes more valuable. If you define value as being just the market price of the commodity, then if supply stays constant and demand increases more rapidly in a given sector, then it is in fact the case that you expect prices in that sector to go up and if demand lowers uh, relative to supply, then you can also expect prices to go down. But if you define value as those things, you can in fact say that, well, things become more or less valuable. But if you define value to be something else... Now that's quite a big concession because he's about to completely contradict himself and do all these mental gymnastics about, you know, starting to mix in or, you know, the whole thing on exchange and use value, etc. And then starts talking about Karl Marx, etc. Forget that point for a second. What he has basically stated there is he's saying that that's if you define value down to the laws of supply and demand, in other words, consumer's preference, determining what price is. He's saying that the classical economists basically rejected that, that the classical economists would look at value down to, you know, something else. Okay, he has more or less stated that, he's made that clear himself, you've heard that, just listen to this. Which is what the classicals are going to do then you might find that, in fact, value stays the same. So, I mean, this absolute, he's trying, again, to present this single notion of value that I'm going to argue is single-minded, and he's just going to say, oh, look, this disproves the theory. No, if we play with the rules of the classical economists, for example, let's say, for them, uh, well, I mean, there's differences, but uh, in the basic Ricardian uh, conception of value is relative vertical integrated labor times. And if there is mobility across sectors and people understand what's happening in different sectors, well, by this meaning that there is mobility, then what you can expect is that if it takes the same amount of time, if it costs the same to produce the two shirts, that their relative uh, labor times will not differ, they, they will still be the same, and thus their relative prices will not differ independently of uh, whether some people suddenly value this thing more or less. If there is competition and there is mobility across sectors, then you can expect value to remain the same if you define value to be relative labor times 
and you see how relative labor times bring about a given natural price. And that's why the argument's deeply flawed, because this is his argument basically making from the Ricardian argument to state that, well, the value of something is just going to be the same. So the two t-shirts are just going to be of the same value, the same price relative to that of the average necessary labour time, etc. of what he's going on about. How then does the t-shirt that's not selling become of the same value and price as the product that is selling. Of course, in the real world, that just isn't how things work. And there's a reason why prices fluctuate. To say that a product is not selling is going to hold the same value as that of a product that is selling just makes no logical sense whatsoever. The real true value of something is what you hold value in something. That's what's going to make you exchange and part with your money. It's not because of the, the physical aspect of it. It's down to your own personal preference what determines value. That's why the Milton Friedman t-shirt when it drives up in demand, it's got of higher value than that of the, you know, t-shirt that isn't selling. This is a nice thing about subjective value. Our values do differ. Uh, I would not be caught on the street wearing a Che t-shirt because I think he was a scoundrel, right? I would love to wear a Milton Friedman t-shirt. In fact, I'm eager to wear this for the first time. I value this t-shirt more highly than do other people. And that's one of the beautiful things about understanding subjective value. <laughs> I mean, this is just so, so ridiculous. I mean, he's just saying something that is so obvious that he likes something more than another thing. And he's just there saying this, pretending that this somehow is going to disprove anything said by Adam Smith or by David Ricardo or by Marx on value. I mean, this is just laughable. So if you're saying that that is obvious, that the person has greater preference over one over the other, it's the consumer who's going to determine what the real value of something is. How the hell can you say that the Che Guevara t-shirt that isn't selling, that isn't in demand, is of the same value as the other t-shirt? How can you not even understand that? This is where he goes on about the whole thing to do with the difference on and his video goes on a considerable uh, length so to cut straight to the point he just goes on about this whole thing to do with exchange value versus the use value etc just have a listen to what he says it's important to understand that the value is not in the thing itself. It doesn't come like the Marxists believed or even the classical economists believe from the amount of labor that goes into producing it. Value is not a product of how many other resources went into producing something. Ultimately, things have value only if and only because human beings want those things. Now here is where the big problem that makes me question this guy's academic integrity comes into question because he is going to lie with without any sort of shame about what the classicals thought use value was i mean they uh, marx at least had this differential between had this definition of value as something that manifested in two different ways one which was exchange value another one which was use value and he was specifically clear and in in the classical tradition Pretty much all other economists were also clear about this, that commodities, before they have any exchange value, people must want to purchase and to consume those commodities. Yes, that's the point. People and the exchange value of something, the value of whatever it may be, is only going to be of value if consumers want something. But consumers are not one entity. That's what you don't understand. You have basically stated earlier on as a concession that from the Ricardian point of view, you would reject and say that it's wrong for consumers to determine what prices are and that the two t-shirts would somehow hold the same value and same price, despite the fact one is selling and the other is not, which doesn't make rational sense whatsoever. This exchange is only going to take place on someone's own subjective theory of value of that product. Because although, you know, 
To me, I might hold high value in that specific given product. Someone else may not. That exchange value will come from my subjective theory of the value of that product. In other words, it's not something objective. It's subjective. It's my opinion of that product. Therefore, I'm going to agree upon that exchange. You know, that's how things work. It's the same of how things work in auctions, etc. The reality is, trying to bastardize everything and speaking about exchange and use, what value is that? The value is down to what consumers are willing to pay for something. The value is down to, in this form of exchange, what someone's opinion of that product is. That's where value really comes from. This is in no sense a criticism of the classical theory of value because it is assumed when you're dealing with commodities that they have used value. And in fact, that is how commodity is defined. It's defined as an object that has value, but also has an exchange value because commodities, when, well, when exchange is generalized, are not produced just to be consumed, but for exchange. Which is to say, you don't understand what value really is. And besides, you're saying the exchange value had to come from the consumer, exactly, to each and every single individual consumer, depending on what produce, produce it is, you could talk about all the variety of different types of clothing, etc. No two people are going to hold the same value in clothing such as this, for example. The only people who obviously support rangers or whatever. Value of something is going to be determined down to consumer preference. And no two are the same. It's the consumer's own subjective theory of value that's going to determine the value of the product. Not simply just because, oh, it's good exchange and, oh, it's made from this specific given material. Oh, you know, here's a water bottle that you tried to use as an example and this is the resources it's made out of. Yeah, very good. What's it going to be worth when you stick it out in there on the shelf and it doesn't sell? The reality is, it's not down to the resources you used just because it holds water. It doesn't mean anything. It's going to be determined down to whether consumers want to buy it or not. So yes, value is down to subject. If you can't grasp that, then you're a lost cause. And now other laws play, uh, other laws come into play, and now you have to look at other patterns and you have to understand different conceptions of value that emerge from capitalist societies themselves. And this is why these economists were not so simplistic as to just limit themselves to, oh, people like things, therefore, that's it. That's it. We don't need to explain anything more. We just need to look. People like things. Good. Okay. That's it. No, it's not. It's not. Life is more complicated than this. If the value of things was down to other factors such as labour time and labour quantity, etc. And it wasn't just really down to that of what consumers themselves determine, you wouldn't see what you're seeing today with the fluctuating prices. And the reality of the fluctuating prices is telling you consumers' preference changes over time. Because if you were to reject that, which of course you did earlier on, and if you're trying to say that value is going to be determined down to something else, then that is truly remarkable. Because of it, out of millions of different products, and you could look at music, you could look at games, videos, films, all sorts, even, you know, books, etc. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. Each and every single individual consumers all get their own individual preference. That's the real value. Because if something is not going to sell in the shelves, it doesn't matter how much labour time you put into it. It doesn't matter the amount of labour quantity and resources that you used for it. What value is if it doesn't sell? You basically said that the t-shirt the that wasn't selling holds the same price and value is the product that is selling and that's why you're irrational. And Marx, and, and we're going to look at this, Marx made it very clear that an object must be useful and furthermore, use value does in fact emerge from the material, the physical uh, properties. The use value is something subjective. The question is, who is it going to be valuable to? It's not as simple as saying, oh, well, it's got a use value because it, you know, stems from these specific given properties, from these resources, etc. What does that matter? doesn't mean anything. You could say something is, uh, is of use because you brought it from these resources. Stick it out there on the shelf. The, the reality is, each and every single individual consumer all have their own preference. So... 
the real determining factor over what is going to be useful or not is going to be down to the subjective opinion and value of the consumer. Or from the social mental properties of uh, a given commodity. It's not just that um, value exists in people's mind, but it also is not independent from the physical aspect, from the size, from, 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 the, from the components that bring about a given commodity. What the true value of something is number one, is the, the product going to sell in the first place? Right? So if a product is selling, that's where the value comes from. And the value in relation to if the product is selling comes from each and every single individual's own preference. Which is the very reason why the t-shirt with Che Guevara when the price fell is indicating to the market as a price signal it's no longer valuable because that's just consumer preference. They moved away from it. You can't just then say, oh well, you know, the other t-shirt that's in higher demand is the exact same price and value as the product that isn't selling. I mean, <laughs> Jesus. Of course he's saying, and he's trying to add in this thing to do with consumer demand, if it's going to sell that is. Well, that's where the real value is going to come from. Consumers buying it. <laughs> but the question is, who is buying it? This t-shirt's just uh, another t-shirt. And therefore, uh, it had this amount of necessary labour time that went into it. And therefore, from its physical aspect, it's got the same value as the other one. And the consumer isn't determining that value. <sighs> you know, it's, it really is an, an, an eyesore. Folk, the whole thing on the exchange value, and I think this is just where it pretty much ends, right? Because the exchange value is going to be determined down to the subjective opinion of a consumer. How else do you think an exchange takes place? I mean, this is common sense. And then sit there and say that, oh well, you know, there's other factors that come into play, such as, you know, the labour time and all the labour quantity and all the rest of it. So anyway, folk, I hope you've enjoyed the video, because, let's be honest, in terms of these arguments, I've been through it numerous times. I, I don't mean to sound repetitive with them because I had been requested to do this in particular. It really is as simple as saying that it's down to subjective theory. It really is. It is that simple. It's just the fact that these socialists are doing mental gymnastics because they really don't understand why value really is subjective. It's just like the $2,000 gold pizza folk. It really is somebody's subjective value whether they pay for that or not. And, you know, it's it's not down to, you know, some labour time or some labour quantity or the amount of resources used into producing something or that. Well, it's physical aspects. Like, <laughs> what the hell does that matter? It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't that's, that's not going to be the determining factor whether it's going to sell or not. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm done arguing with these type of people. I am done. Right? Because you're never, ever, ever going to get through to them. You're never going to get through to them, folk. They are far gone. So, I hope you've liked the video. Uh, be sure to share the video. And of course, like I say, folk, um, if you've taken anything from it, then you know, you know f something fantastic. Um, I greatly appreciate everything. And of course, I shall talk to you later. Right? <laughs> Cheers.